right, so we are into now week five of the series Clay Feet, which uh, for those that are kind of following along in the Lenten season, Lent is six weeks long, so that means next week is Palm Sunday, which is the beginning of Holy Week, which ushers us into um, the road that Jesus takes to the cross. And there's going to be then all kinds of things that are filled that week with, uh, with, with worship on, on uh, Thursday, Friday, and then again Sunday for Easter. And so all of those things, that means we're coming down towards the end of it. What are we listening to? What are we hearing from God in the midst of the Clay Feet series? We talk about Clay Feet as uh, we are imperfect and God is perfect. He's the one who's molding us together. He's putting those things all in place. And we are imperfect vessels, but we have a God that we serve that's much bigger than our imperfect nature. I uh, have this question to start us off today is, if you were trying to describe to someone what God looks like, what would you say? Now, if you look at the descriptions of God throughout uh, kind of the popular television shows, what does God usually look like on television? He's old. He's got usually a long white beard, and he's feeble. It's kind of the way that, that it works, you know, like because God is old, and so therefore he's got to be some kind of old man, and, uh, and also usually God is white. I don't know why. I think it's from uh, white nationalism that's played out in our nation, but that's another topic altogether. But either way, what we look at is this idea that God is somehow this old white dude who's sitting on a throne, who's just kind of sitting here tinkering with things. It's not a good description. Why? Because when we see and we know what God, God is spirit and must be worshipped in spirit and truth. And so when we say, here's God, what does God look like? This is the way that we can describe God, is through God's attributes. And this is the reason why the clay feet is all about the attributes of God. Because this is something that we can describe to people. God's perfect nature. God being the one who is in complete control of all things because He has a bigger vision than we do. God sees things that we don't see. God is actively at work in all things. So even though we can't touch, we can't see God, we rely a lot on these attributes because they can then be the words that we use to communicate with other people. We can say, our God is loving our God is faithful. And so when we get into that today, this is the topic is faithfulness, the faithfulness of God. And we're going to start with the, as we have throughout this series, we are looking at first, we are looking at first the idea that there is the nature of imperfectness within people. And so we're going to look at someone who is in God's word who is, as they would call, a pillar of faith. And we're going to find out that they are also not so perfect. So Genesis chapter 12, if you'd like to follow along, you're welcome to. Genesis 12, and we're looking at uh, 10 through 14. Abram. At, the, at that time, a severe famine struck the land of Canaan, forcing Abram to go down to Egypt where he lived as a foreigner. As he was approaching the border of Egypt, Abram said to his wife, Sarai, Look, you are a very beautiful woman. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Let's kill him so that we can have her. So please tell them that you are my sister. Then they will spare my life and treat me well because of their interest in you. 
So here's the part, right? We see, and Abram is Abraham. We know Abraham is like, you know, as they call him, the father of all generations, right? He's Father Abraham who had many sons, many generations came out of Abraham. We see that's the Abraham upon which not only Judaism, not only Christianity, and not only Islam, all these things have a basic foundation understanding that Abraham is this great pillar of the faith. But we are also going to point out today that there are some flaws in Abraham. Abraham should have been thinking about his wife and the safety of his wife, but instead, what was he thinking? He's thinking about his own safety. He's thinking about all the ways that something could go wrong for him, not for her. So he's going down to Egypt and he's like, hey, so... Why don't we just uh, spread the word that you're my sister and we got like a close relationship because we're kin. And so that way they're not going to try to kill me and take you. It's not a very faithful relationship. We see that uh, in marriage and God talks about marriage quite a bit. Marriage in the New Testament talks about marriage in a way that says we, as uh, you know, as husbands or what as should be sacrificing for our spouse, and that way we are then in accordance with what God has laid out. He says you should be willing to sacrifice, but Abraham wasn't thinking sacrifice. He was thinking, what's the way I can get out of this and not be murdered? Not thinking about Sarah. He's thinking about Abraham. And so what we see is that even, yes, this pillar of the faith, Abraham, is also have some moments where faithfulness is not the thing that's on his mind. He's thinking self-preservation and not faithfulness. So we're going to see today, and we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to be faithful. And so we're going to look at then the basic foundation, understanding what does it mean to be faithful. So faithful is understood as being steadfast, dedicated, dependable, and worthy of trust. We know what faithfulness looks like. Why? Because oftentimes we've seen the other side, unfaithfulness. We see that there are many times in our life and around the world where we have looked to people to be faithful and they haven't given us that. We see a lot of times that people promise, they say a lot of good things, but then they don't follow through. So we look at the Old Testament. The Old Testament gives us only 25 times that this word faithful is used. And we're going to see that most of the time, most of, I didn't say all, but most of the time this is in reference to God. And we're going to get to that here in a little bit. But only 25 times. But then when you get to the New Testament, you see this word used 158 times times. So you get the Old Testament that's talking about faithfulness and talking about some faithful people. Moses is referred to as being faithful to God, but also Moses wasn't perfect either. We've gone over this already in this series. But then you see 158 times where faithfulness is brought up in the New Testament. And we see that there is a paradigm, there is an understanding that there is faithfulness that should be at the center. And it doesn't matter whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, the meaning remains the same. It's loyal, it's trustworthy, and it's unchanging. And we're going to get to that uh, understanding of unchanging because I think it's a big one because really unchanging, what does it say? It says it's basic understanding of, of faithfulness and unchanging is saying I've said something and now I'm going to do that. 
And there's nothing that's going to be able to change my perspective or change my mind from that peace. So let's look at a couple of examples of faithfulness. These are both from the, uh, the New Testament. And so we're going to look at uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 25. Now regarding your question about the young women who are not yet married, I do not have a command for the Lord from the Lord for them, but the Lord in his mercy has given me wisdom that can be trusted, and I will share it with you. Right? So what we see is this idea that you know, as Paul is writing, he's talking about because some of the, the women have been brought up about you know trustworthiness, faithfulness. And what he's saying to them, he's like, I don't have a word for that yet, but God calls them, and God says to us that his wisdom, his advice, his following can be faithful, can be trusted. Revelation, go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation 2, verse 10. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for ten days, but you, if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. You see, there's a part in a piece that we're looking at faithfulness, and we're seeing some examples, and God's calling, and ultimately, God's in that revelation passage saying, I also want you to remain faithful to the words that I've spoken to you. So here's a question. Every week or every other week, however you get paid, you take your check to the bank, and you bring your check up to the teller, and you say to the teller, I want this cashed. And week after week, you go and do the same thing over and over again. If, you, if this teller was only right 90% of the time, would you call this, faith, uh, uh, this teller faithful? No, right? I mean, that's, you know, you'd be like, no, no, like, this isn't right. Like, here was the check. This is how much you were supposed to give to me, and you didn't. And you would say, even if there was like once and it was wrong, you're like, hold up, wait a second. This, you're not faithful to your position of what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to look at the money that says that right on the check, and that's what you're supposed to give to me. And when we're looking at faithfulness, we want that to be right. Not just some of the time. We want it to be right 100% of the time. That's what we look at at faithfulness. is not just a fraction. It's going to be the whole. So when we're looking at people, and we're looking at humanity, and there are so many things around us right now that remind us that people are making promises that they're not willing to keep. There are people who are willing to say, I'm going to promise you the moon only to give you the dirt. And you're like, but hold up a second. Like, you promised that this was going to, you said that this was what was going to happen and yet didn't follow through. What that does for us is it kind of chips away at our own humanity. Why? Because it says, oh, well, ultimately that means that no one's ever going to be faithful. No one's ever going to keep their promise. No one's ever able to fulfill this. The faithful person is the one who can keep their word and keep their promise even if it costs them something. You see, this is the where it actually gets down to a lot of the, the faithfulness pieces that when we are looking at people, when we're looking at circumstances, when we're trying to be able to see the things that are happening around us, we are saying we want people to be able to keep their promises, what they're saying, even if it comes down to, like I've got to be able to choose between the, the things that I'd like to do, the things that I don't, you know, like the flesh is driving me to, and the things that I've said that I would do. 
And sometimes that does come at a cost to us. It means that we're not going to be able to do what we wanted to do, but what we said we were going to do. And instead, what we be able to look at here today is not looking at all the ways that we see unfaithfulness, but we want to see that God is faithful. And how do we know that God is faithful? Well, as the wonderful song goes, the B-I-B-L-E, that's the book. It speaks of God's faithfulness from generation to generation. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. We got dropping in verses here, here and there, so if you're not able to follow along, don't worry about it. Just sit back. These are just some verses to be able to talk about faithfulness. So 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9, God will do this. For he is faithful to do what he says, and he's invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul is trying to reinforce for us this idea of faithfulness. He's saying God is, if God has said it, God is going to do it. God is faithful. Go to Old Testament, Psalm Psalm verse, uh, 36, verse 5. Your unfailing love, O Lord, is vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. So what does that mean? It means it goes beyond even the things that we can imagine, even the things that we can see. God's faithfulness is even greater than what you can imagine faithfulness would be. Because as we look at unfaithfulness, and as I said, as it chips away at our humanity, we also look at the things of God and we're saying, but hold up. There is faithfulness that is greater than what we've seen. There is one who is faithful to every promise that's been spoken. And it's even beyond the parts that are known to us. But how else do we know? You see, God models faithfulness. And this is where when we look at the Old Testament, we look at the New Testament, God is saying, I'm not just going to speak of faithfulness and then go behind your back and be unfaithful. That, again, is the way that we have seen it work in the world. And that's not good. So what does God say? He's like, you know what? This is what I'm going to do to help you understand faithfulness. I'm not just going to speak about it. I'm also going to do it. God speaks of modeling. God does the modeling. He says, not only do I want you to hear it, but I also want you to see it at work. I want you to see how faithfulness is going to play out in the world today. And I want you to see that I'm the one who's going to begin it. So we go to our passage that was spoken of uh, in worship by the worship team um, a little while ago. But this is like a key verse for today. You know, something that uh, if you've got Bibles you want to highlight, something that you can go back to, memorize, something that you can put up on your, uh, if you've got dry erase markers, that you can put up on your mirror if you'd like to be able to have a visual reminder of what God is at work doing and how God is faithful. This is a wonderful verse to put up there. And verse 9, Understand therefore that the Lord your God is, or the Lord your God is indeed God. He is a faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. You see, as God calls us, he says, this is the way that it's going to play out. I'm going to promise things and I'm going to fulfill those things. And God reminds us generation after generation 
this is the wonderful part about having the testimony of God that's laid out before us. The testimony of God has a whole broad range of people. So we've seen Moses and Abraham. We've seen Adam and Eve. We've seen his children. We've seen all the ways in which God has promised things and then fulfilled things. And God comes to Abraham. He says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. This isn't going to be dependent upon you. It's going to be dependent upon me. And this is the Abraham that then he then says, I'm also then when he's got kids, he says, Abraham's gone. Now I'm going to renew this covenant with Isaac, with Jacob. Again, even generations later, to David, the king. You see, God says, here's these moments that I want to establish for you. A moment that I'm going to say, here's the promises again. I am going to be your God and you are going to be my people. You are mine. I am yours. And this is the covenant that he comes back to these people. Why? Because generation after generation, we see a people who are unfaithful to God. We see people who are constantly saying, yeah, God, we want to follow you. We want to do what you say. And then in the next breath, we turn around these same people who have promised that they're going to follow God and they're going to dedicate themselves. They turn around and they don't. And this is the reason why this covenant, this promise that God has made to these people is not dependent upon them. And it's the same reason that this promise, this covenant, is not dependent upon you. Faithfulness is central to God's character. And this is where, uh, this is a great verse. 1 John, so it's towards the end of the Bible. 1 John 1, nine. you'll recognize it because we say it a lot. 1 John 1, nine. but if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all wickedness, all unrighteousness. You see, here's the part. God recognizes who you are. He knows who I am, who you are. He knows that we are not going to be able to live this life completely faithful. But God is also saying here that He's not going to give up on us. He says those who know, like we know ourselves, it's the reason why we do confession every single Sunday is because we recognize who we are before God and we're saying, you know what? Like, I, I wasn't faithful again, God. And it says that here, reinforcing, just so you know, God's the one who's faithful in this. And He says, if you come and you confess your sins, it's God who is faithful to that promise that He's going to cleanse you. Forgive you. And set you free. It's the wonderful promise of God that doesn't leave us in our shame, doesn't leave us in our guilt, doesn't leave us in our failure. And this is the very central part of who God is. Is God saying, just so you know, this is the kind of God that I am. I am faithful to that promise. I'm going to be faithful when you come and confess your sins that you don't have to wonder, well, I wonder if God forgave me that time. Nope, God's promise says this. He is faithful to that. He's going to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you. there's also the other central pieces of who God is. That God also supports us in temptation and persecution. Why? Because Jesus tells us in the New Testament that when we are followers of Jesus, 
that we're going to be tempted. He's saying that there's be moments in our lives that temptation's going to be floating in front of us. It's going to be there, and we have an opportunity to not be able to jump into the temptation, but instead to be able to rely on the promises of God that He is there even in those moments. It's the same thing when Jesus says, when you come and follow Jesus, when we lay down our lives, He's saying there's going to be persecution. There are people, because they hated Jesus, what makes us think that they're going to love us? Persecution is a real thing. The church today doesn't always uh, see it. I would say even most likely, this is where I put it, the Western church does not always recognize it in the actual persecution. The Western church has made up ways in which we are being persecuted that we actually aren't. But when you start to look at the persecution that happens around the world, you're saying that's where persecution actually is. Where people are saying, I'm a follower of Jesus, and they've been killed because of it. It's not just that they're saying, well, the government gives me rights, and so therefore, if they go back on those rights, then I'm being persecuted. No, those rights are not guaranteed for you as a follower of Jesus. What we do is we attempt to live our lives to be faithful, not to the promises of our government, the promises of our politicians. No, we, we rest in the promises of God, that God is the one who's faithful. We say, but yes, there could be persecution that comes along the way. There could be persecution because we stand with Jesus. It shouldn't surprise us. But Jesus says, know this, that even in persecution, I'm faithfully telling you that I'm with you. The human mind has a hard time believing that there can be any kind of 100% certainty on anything. You find a lot of people that guarantee and a lot of people who are saying 100%, right? But when we're looking at it, we're saying it's a hard time. So when we take our mind, our human mind, and try to put that on God, we're saying God's saying we can believe His Word. God says that we can trust that everything that He said is what He's going to do. But it's really hard for us to match it up. And so the way that we're going to... uh, close today is we say, who can you trust? Who are we going to trust today? Are we going to trust people who are saying, you can't trust God either? When they also have a proven track record of being unfaithful? Who are you going to trust? We have to go back to and understand that God is the one who has a proven track record generation after generation after generation. That even when people were unfaithful, it was God who was the one who was faithful. We know that people who promise everything and deliver nothing, we recognize it, we see it, but it doesn't have to leave us jaded and understanding that everything must be that way. God has has been faithful to every promise, every word that He's ever spoken. And what we can rely on today is this testimony of God. The testimony that even when things around us are looking at all kinds of unfaithfulness, all kinds of people saying things and not following through, is that we said, but here's the wonderful news. God is the faithful one. Every word that's spoken He means it. It's true. We can trust and rely, not with 90% certainty, 
but 100% certainty that God remains faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.